Welcome to the Unconventional Path, entrepreneurship and innovation stories and ideas. Hi, I'm Bela Musitz, coming to you from the Capital Region campus of Clarkson University in Schenectady, New York. I'm a former three-time entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and now the David D. Ray Professor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship here at Clarkson University. And from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean in Münster, Germany, I'm Mike Wasserman, Professor of International Management at the Münster University of Applied Sciences. Just a note about our podcast, the two of us want to take lessons that we've learned over the last three decades as entrepreneurs, investors, managers, and professors, and leverage our network of interesting friends, former students, business partners, and others we've met along the way in our life's journey to bring you interesting stories, ideas, and insights into innovation, entrepreneurship, and the people that take unconventional paths to find happiness at work and in life. Before we get to today's guest, a quick thank you to our sponsors. Clarkson University, and the Munster University of Applied Sciences. Today's guest is Tony Civitella. This is a great story on a number of different levels. First, Tony is a very successful entrepreneur who started as an intern at TransFinder and is now its CEO. Wow, I've never heard of that transition before. Yeah, it's another element of how important internships can be, Mike. Second, it's a great story of an entrepreneur who came to this country from Italy with his family as a young boy. He tells this wonderful tale of how at the age of 15, he helped his father buy a car. Tony was the translator. Wait, Bela, don't give away the punchline. Make the listeners listen to the whole episode. Okay, that makes sense, Mike. So let's get to it. Just a note, we recorded this live at a once a month entrepreneurship event at the New York Biz Lab. So the sound quality reflects the venue. As in some of our past interviews at the New York Biz Lab, Rick DeRico is my co-interviewer. Oh, wait. And Bela, tell them about the tale of two Tonys. Oh, yeah. Good point, Mike. This is part of a double header. Tony Civitella is actually Rick's boss. And in a follow-up interview, Rick and I will be interviewing Tony Collins, president of Clarkson University. Tony Collins is my boss's boss's boss. These are two very different people with, as you'll find out, some similarities in their journeys. Okay, I can't wait any longer, Bela. Let's get the first Tony interview started with Tony Civitella. All right. So uh, I, get, I, I, get the, uh, I get the honor of the first question. Great. So you're uh, the president and CEO of uh, TransFinder, and there may be some people in the audience who no, don't know what TransFinder is, what you guys do. So could you just kind of set the stage for us, what the business is, what it does? That's great. Well, thank you for, for uh, coming today. It seemed like there's uh, not too many empty seats, so I'm excited. So thank you for coming here today. Uh, TransFinder has the word finder in it. So we create a lot of products that has to do with finding, it's mapping. But the word trans is about transportation. That's why it's called TransFinder. And we started really in the school bus industry. We, our clients are made up of about 25 million students a day. So if you add up all of our client students, that's about 25 million students that attend these schools. About 5 million of them actually ride school buses that have been, their routes been designed and managed by our software. So it gets, gets so excited I'm thinking that now it's 30 years we're celebrating. I'm thinking in 30 years, think about how many students Five million every year. Well, maybe not year number one, but significant amount of millions of students in the United States have actually ridden these school buses that our software has been managing. Who knows? It could be some very important person. It could be a movie star that just won the best actor award. Well, I know not that guy because he rocked it out. But just excited. Awesome. You know? So, first question from me, I think it's a nice question. Tony's mother, by the way, is in the audience, and so is his uncle, who just flew in from Italy yesterday. Last um, night. Last night. So, so, tell me just a little bit about, you know, you, for those of you who don't know, Tony moved here when he was nine years old from Italy. So, I just was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about, just, you know, who maybe had the greatest influence in your life, your mother or your father? Your mother's here, so you might want to say that. Uh, <laughs> but, like, some lessons that you've learned, you know, um, and, and just overcoming some of those challenges that maybe some typical nine-year-olds don't struggle with uh, born here. I mean, obviously, you only told me you only have an hour to talk, so that could be days, I really think. <laughs> but, you know, I'm very excited. My mom is here, my uncle, Gio Franchino, is here. So I just want to say 
Grazie, benvenire. Thank you for coming. He, I, mean, I have a pretty big birthday this Sunday, and so uh, he's coming for my birthday. So I can't say I'm 29 anymore. So, <laughs> but nine years old, you really don't know what's going on. But it's education, and my pa my parents moved here for a better opportunity, and and it happened to work out pretty good for me. It really did. But it was education, and uh, at nine years old, I was held back. I repeated the same grade that I attended in Italy, and it really shocked me. It's like, welcome to the United States. You're not that smart. We're going to just make you repeat whatever grade you did in, in Italy. Like, wow, so that hurts, right? You've, that's your welcome mat to the country. And those are tough, but, you know, I've learned to just get over it. I happen to excel in math, which is exciting. And um, my teacher saw something special in me, and she, uh, my first day of fourth grade, she came in and said, this kid needs to jump to another grade. And so I jumped a grade, which is great. Think about my confidence. But meanwhile, nine years old, my mom and dad really didn't, didn't speak in English at all. I'm, I'm really, my, my, my sister and I are translating for them. And I'm talking about translating, not just, good morning, I want to buy some, a bushel of apples, but hey, this is the unemployment form. Can you fill this out for me? Tell know, us those are the about, kind of stuff that. About negotiating with your dad, because you had to translate. Oh, your dad. my father was great. My father was a great negotiator, so he negotiated everything. And uh, I remember just going some, I can't mention uh, car dealers. But remember, I'm 13 years old, and he can't really speak English, but he wants to buy a car. And so you can't buy a car if you can't speak English. First of all, you're going to get beat up. You're going to get, you know, torched. So he would say, he would tell this man this much. And I'll go, you want me to tell him this much? Like, hey, you're just here to translate. You're not here to negotiate. <laughs> and it was like almost an insulting level. But he was like, Dad, he's not going to be okay with this. Listen, if you can't do it, we're out of here. And like, you know, I was like, all right. So I would look in this man like, well, my father wants to offer you this. And I go, well, why is this 13-year-old kid even talking to me? We're talking about thousands of dollars. Who the hell is this guy? And so many times my father would get so upset and go, let's go. Just like that. Let's go. He did say that in actually English. Let's go. Or he would say a couple words. And we're like, oh, my God, you know, this is so embarrassing. I feel embarrassed. This man is downplaying us and just making us feel so horrible. All right, come back. It's like, it worked almost all the time. <laughs> so I tell everybody, and I'm not saying you should go to Macy's. You should go to Macy's. And you should say, I love the soup. Is there anything you could take off the soup? And they're not going to just say, hey, give me $100 on cash. You know, I don't recommend it. But guess what? In that drawer... They have VIP tickets. They have, I'm sorry, uh, you could get 50% off a $700 suit if you treat them nice. 50% off. Guess what? If you don't ask, you'll never get it. Ever. Ever. So, I mean, there's a lot of lesson learned, but my May father's Macy's more... Macy's be a sponsor now. <laughs> I, no, I think, and I'm not saying Macy's, and I'm not saying go to the Gallup saying, yeah, I'm not paying this much for the bananas. <laughs> I think you're going to pay the X number of dollars per, per pounds. But I think you, it's negotiating. It's more, it's, hey, if you really want it, if not, walk away. But don't negotiate just because it's a game. And then if, as soon as they say yes, I was kidding anyway. Lousy. Get out of there. But you really, if you want it, and if you don't, you're going to. And by the way, the problem is my father always say you have to have cash in hand. Because if that individual say, I, okay, well, you're losing that money. That's why he felt like give cash in hand because here's a hundred dollars. Like, but I want five hundred. Here's a hundred dollars, and now you're thinking here's a, it's the bird in hand. Here's a hundred dollars. You could just grab it. Like, all right, take this, because you could just negotiate and you go, yeah, I don't want it anyway. Like, what? Well, but this man is willing to leave his hundred dollars out of his hand, and I think those are huge in negotiating. Meaning you're serious. You're not just you know, yeah. I want to buy that car, but I'm, not pay, I'm going to pay $10,000 less than you want. That's nonsense, but he was serious. So, so Tony. Is that the back cut? That's awesome. I love it. So talk, talk to cut. us how that has sort of, you, you, you've taken that lesson as a 9 to 14-year-old or 15-year-old, and you've used that later on in building the business. Well, I think when, what you learn is that you can't do that everywhere. right? You can't do that. It's something that you, you can't just pull that type of, 
of negotiation everywhere. There's got to be some sort of respect. But you know that you start now reading people, and they see you. you. The way your body, the way you talk, the way you stand makes you feel that you're, you're confident, you know, that you're, you're serious. And just meeting several people, and just as I was learning the language, obviously I had to become someone that you liked, that I'm liked. You know, I want to make sure that someone liked me, so I had to you know, do things that people were liked me. Yeah, but now, now being a business owner, you're right. on the other side of that table. You're sure. Not, you're not the one buying the car. <laughs> you're the one selling the car. That's true. But we also do buy things, and we have employees, and we have, uh, we have a lot of different things. We have vendors. We have clients. We have clients that, uh, you know, the grass is always greener over the septic tank, right? It's always greener there, and, you know, at least the leach field. And, you know, so many clients of ours would call up and say, you know, your, your competitor is doing a better job and, you know, we're about to leave you. And, like, well, what do you do? You know, what do you do? At this point, you become, you know, you become more sincere and go, wow, we made a mistake. Wow. What can we do to fix this? So, no, I think this is where you, as you talk to these people, you start learning how to communicate. And communication is not just with words. It's how you see people. Shaking the hands. It's those eye contacts make a huge difference. You know why? It makes you look, you're more serious. You're not just here, you got up this morning just to be a big talker. I don't know. So, thank you. That's good. 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 All right. Uh, so, uh, in the audience, they have Tyler Rooney. Where's Tyler Rooney? Tyler Rooney was our first uh, Biz Lab, and our only so far Biz Lab intern, and from Clarkson. Um, Tony, you were an intern. Mm. And uh, Tony, who here is from, went to school at Siena? Can you raise your hand if you're a Siena alum? So Tony was a Siena alum. So can you just tell so you were an intern at Transfinder first. It wasn't called Transfinder time. Right. Can you just tell us a little bit about just how you went from becoming, because maybe Tyler one day wants to become a CEO. How do you go from being an intern to being the CEO of the company? Well, that's something I wasn't thinking about doing. That's not my intention. When I was 19 years old, I was like, oh, I, don't know. I didn't even know what CEO stood for. I really didn't know that. And... Uh, it took me a while, like, oh, that's what it means? What, what's so chief about it? And, uh, <laughs> you know, and so really it, it, it was an opportunity, and I, and I just really wanted to be successful. I, I was, I'm, was a, I'm a driven individual, and I was given an opportunity to solve problems, and I see myself as a problem solver. I love watching YouTubes. I could fix carburetors, and I'm great with YouTube. A lot of times I forget there's, if you drop things in there, it's going to be a hard time to get it back out. But I'm a problem solver, and I was given an opportunity to solve some problems, and I did it. But I also I, I watch other people. I see other software engineers in, in the early 90s getting really these huge deals, massive deals. And, and I couldn't ask for that because the money wasn't there. So I'm like, well, maybe I could get a deal, which means a piece of the company. So I asked for a shares of the company, you know, because all the hard work I'm putting. I mean, I felt like I was working night and day. And, uh, but you can't give, I'm not asking for cash, but maybe I'm asking for some piece of the company. And uh, Jim Forth came back to me. He was like, oh, I got a way for you to have a piece of the company. You're going to buy share at a time, and you, and you get a piece of the company. And I'm going to let you buy 25% of the company. And at this point... I don't even barely any money on my mom and dad. I really, first of all, software. It's, it's an abstract. Imagine me, and I still, I want to, I could now show her things on my iPhone, and she's got an iPhone too. Uh, you can understand what software is, but 30 years ago, explain to somebody that can't speak English what software is. <laughs> so I revert to, it's the disc. You don't see these discs, and by the way, it used to be floppy before. <laughs> like, I do things, so she would tell her friends that, he puts, he does something with these discs. Good enough. <laughs> but the whole idea is that my, I was able to purchase shares and I got the 25%. I even convinced Jim to 35%. But back to my father and really my family, and, uh, and I can't wait to, to talk to my uncle the next uh, few weeks while he's here. He had these proverbs. And my father had these tons of proverbs. And, his, and uh, there are a lot of them are formulated proverbs. But he also would talk about just these things that really are riddles. And he would talk about in a business environment, a leadership, really, that's how I'm, I'm converting it. In a leadership environment, it always has to be an odd number of people. Odd. Because you guys figure out why it needs to be an odd number? Anybody wants to guess? Tiebreaker. Tie and, but he'd always say, so 
In business, always has to be a number of people. And three is too many. <laughs> right? Right? Three is too many, which means there's only one. And by the way, you can really... <laughs> Got it. It's one. And by the way, it doesn't have to be in the leadership. It just means someone has to make the decision, which means you fo- don't can't say the committee. Committee? No, that individual makes the calls. And by the way, you guys could pick who that leader is, and if that person doesn't work, get them out of there. But someone, so he, you know, that one guy, and I was able to convince the owner of the company to sell me the other 65%. And so I think this is all those those riddles that I could. They're spit. great riddles. Yeah, I, I love this. Yeah. Work. You, you you, and by the way, when Rick uh, came on board at Transfinder, uh, now five six years ago, and he would hear me talk about these things, like where did you where did you get this from? My dad used to say this, like this is good stuff. Like yeah, I don't know what it means. I mean, it means this, and I go, wow, that's deeper meaning than I thought. I mean, I got rooster. I mean, I'm sure. <laughs> We might touch on some of those. The they're horses, awesome. I got so many great riddles. And they're very good proverbs that I actually, I use it at the office probably once a day. That's true. I can uh, vouch for that. Um, I want to go to the audience. Do you mind? Uh, we do have a lot of questions, and there will be no shortage of questions, I'm sure. But it, anybody have any initial questions right off the bat for Tony? Don't be shy. Jeff Frankel, you got a question for Tony? I do have a question. Wow. Go for it. How do you, okay, Ken Glass, no, okay, how do you get your Same woman has been cutting my hair since maybe a good 30 years, and my wife hates it. Well, I can just go to barber well, shop. Men do that. I don't, I don't like that. Anyway, but. yeah. Um, Thank you. Over here Thanks. Over here. Wait, wait, wait. Ken? Okay, Ken Glass. <laughs> I'll answer that afterwards. <laughs> he obviously has had some espresso in my place. Him. I'm always using So, Tony, everything. Excellent question. Great question. Oh, that's a great question. We This is RFP season for us. So a lot of the very large opportunities, they don't just, they're purchasing based on RFPs. And we're responding to tons of RFPs. And by the way, some RFPs, they're looking at me like, well, Tony, what do you want to do? Should we go after it now? And I go, we can't go after this. Like, where are the people at? So we, we actually... Um, De- deny or not respond to an RFP that could give us millions of dollars every single year. We don't respond, not because I'm too weak and I'm not ready for the challenge. No, who's going to do it? I only have 24 hours a day. Even if it's just me, I still by myself. So the number one problem that's actually holding back, it's not just Transfinder. Every, I would think every company in this area, where are the people at? Where are they? We talk a good game. We talk about that. But who's actually doing something to bring people here? And I'm not, my son is nine years old. I can't wait till the kid's going to get 25. I don't have time. So that's really the problem. And I think a lot of smart people in this room, please figure out how to, you know, when you see some stranger that's out of town, just kidnap him or something. <laughs> we'll pay him He's good kidding. money. He's kidding. Over here. Any right. question? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, let me just, can I have a quick yeah, follow-up please. to that? So in, in our venture business, in my venture business, we see the same problem everywhere. So good people are really difficult to find. Whether your business is located in New York City or Chicago or Schenectady, they're really hard to find. So how do we, as, as, as a business person, how do you solve that problem? Because right? other people are not going to bring people in. So when you think about recruiting, how do you think about recruiting? How do you sort of think about, hey, that's a person I want to come have join our business. How can I get them? How can I convince them to come here? That's a great question. So we're doing, we're trying everything. We're sponsoring the uh, Albany Empire. Did you guys know that during those games last season, there was a $2,000 reward? A total stranger could actually could say, I got my nephew or my next door neighbor and wants a job. Do you want to, can you, here's a reference. And if we hire that person, that total stranger got a a $2,000 check, and that employee that we just hired got a $5,000 bonus. Do you know we got nobody? Nobody? Can you imagine? You just put, just give your neighbors as a reference. You got yourself 2,000 bucks. It was on our ads everywhere. We didn't get anybody. So we're trying so many different things. We're 
Hackathons. Hackathons, right? We did hackathons. We, we, and we did hire somebody. But really, we're thinking, wow, we did all this effort to hire one individual. But I think as a technology, I have a, an advantage. We can develop software anywhere in the world. And that's really what's going to, it's driving me going to outside this area for software engineers. But that's really it. The sales, the service, the administration it still has to be here. And we still need those people. So I think I can't wait. I'm, I can't just keep saying no to some of these opportunities and get a, a half as good a company, get it, because they're, they could do it. So I, you know, obviously I started a company in, in Shanghai. It's all softwares, I mean, software engineers, and I had to. I mean, now it's 50-50. We have about 50% people in Skytree and 50% in, in Shanghai. Well, we had to. What am I supposed to do? You know? Let me go over here first, and then I'll get you. Is kids going to the camps that the kids carry around when they're in school? It's actually a lot of things. Typically, it's just really, it starts really in bus routes. Right. You, you, a school district like Niskuna, you couldn't imagine how many millions of miles they put in on a yearly basis. So it's, can we shave them a couple miles a day? And we actually have a formula. If we could save a school district 11 miles every day for 180 days, our software gets paid for itself. It's really that level. So it's just software. It's managing bus routes. But then, of course, it goes beyond that. Good question. There's a pass. But now parents want to know, oh, where's the kid at? Did he get on the bus? Did you get off the bus? So we're now doing everything around the school bus. We're here. So I was just thinking that what you're saying about getting people to come into the building, which is, and I think right now, like, all these Have you had any experience from hiring people from retraining programs like Albany Can Code? That's a good question. We, we think that... Uh, so we're working on some very specific software. It's logistic. It's mapping. So this is where it's even more rare. And so we're using a technology called uh, ESRI, E-S-R-I. It's, it's mapping. And uh, so we do a lot of little research. We found like two or three people that actually has that experience in this region. And by the way, the majority of them are, are in are our company. So this is really where it gets really tough. So we are willing to train them. We're willing to do anything it takes but you also want to be able to say, hey, I'm taking on this challenge. You know? Over here. Lauren. Good question. So you, how, how big was the company when this when you started? So I started with me, uh, the owner, and his secretary. And then when I ended up buying uh, them two were not there, it was just six of us in 2000. So it sounds like the growth of the business. You've had to go through many what you know, some would call break points and transition points. And to be the leader still in that position, how, how were you able to change to be that person? Uh, that's a good one. By the way, I saw a great, a great um, concert. It was Elton John. I don't know if you guys saw this a couple weeks ago. And he talked about still standing. You guys know that, that song? And I tell you, it really hit me hard because he had a beautiful story before he sang that song about how a lot of you know, his, his friends are not standing anymore. They didn't make it. And he is. And you know, I keep thinking about it. What does it mean for me? All of my competitors, they've sold their company. All of them. They've sold it multiple times. They're not, my competitors that I knew 30 years ago, they're not there anymore. Their company may still be there, but they sold it multiple times. So why am I not doing that? Right? You know what I mean? Because I, we keep changing things. It's exciting. Maybe I still feel like I'm 29 years old, but it, we got to just keep changing. And I actually don't like the idea. And by the way, I remember the early days, those people think, oh, those mistakes. Because I can't tell you how many people actually slam the door as they're leaving TransFinder, really, and saying, I'm going to read it, I, I'm going to get, you're going to be a, a college program, how to kill a company. Like, you know, you come in every couple months and you change everything. It's like, you know, you don't even give time to see if it's working. You already want to change it. It's like, so I'm thinking, well, maybe I do that. Maybe I do change things up. But now look back. Thank God I did make those changes, because if I did, I would have been a dinosaur. And I think this is where it takes some courage. And by the way, I lost some good employees because they disagreed with me. But it's making very tough decision. We're not doing it. We're canceling. We're doing this. What? Why do you want to change it? It's not personal, man. We're going to lose money. Do you want us to lay people off? So it gets tough. That goes a little bit to the FIO. Figure it out. That's right. Figure it out. And, and, and it's so hard to... 
now there's so many people at the company. There's people that are starting right now, I don't even know what's their name anymore. And it really does bother me, and I try my best. But they don't know that sometimes I am, I mean, what keeps me up at night? It's every two weeks we have payroll. And guess what? That's what keeps me up at night. Do we have enough money to pay everybody? That's what's really keeps me up at night. So we got to make sure the decisions now have to be better and better and at least don't leave a mark. Joe Pasquale, one of our uh, tenants here, actually. Joe, you have a question? <coughs> Thank you, Joe. Awesome. Well, guess why? They're, it's not their job. It's the company's job. So we've actually are going to quadruple our internship programs. We have so many interns now coming in, and their same seats are being rotated every single day because we know that the next awesome employee may be this intern. And by the way, I never got the phone call from any college saying, you know, you really should start hiring some of my people. No. We, again, we figured things out. We've been knocking on doors saying, can we just keep about 2% of these kids stay in this area? It will change this area if we do this every year. But so no one's, and no offense to any colleges or universities in this area, because, you know, I, I respect them. But it's not their job to figure out, are they going to get a job afterwards? They're all going to get a job. And the majority of these kids that are, from, are not from this area go back home. So I think if more companies do what we do, we'll, we would actually increase the number of kids staying here. So it's easy, and we do pay them, by the way. We do pay them. It shouldn't be free labor. So just <laughs> be, being a Clarkson guy, right, just to put it in context, the average Clarkson, you know, math, science, technology grad has five job offers at graduation. Yeah. Well, that's, right. that's the market. So that's what we're competing against, because we compete, as a business here in Schenectady, we compete worldwide for those students, not so just... just you know, locally, we compete worldwide. Just to give you like a little bit of perspective, in the last two weeks, we, um, Tony spoke at Siena to a group of business students, about a couple hundred, a couple hundred students, got some resumes. A lot and of resumes. A week before that, oh good, right. I didn't have that up yeah. there. And then um, a week before that, we had like 20 U Albany students who spent literally two and a half hours at TransFinder meeting all levels, and I think we got 15 resumes out of that. So it is about one-on-one -on -one FaceTime. You're selling. You're selling your company to those students. And that's what we have to do. That's right? what you got. That's how you got to think about it. You got to think about, I'm selling an opportunity to these students. And I think, and are they buying it? And not? I think this area, and I also spoke a couple of days ago at a chamber event, which was great people in a, on a panel, but I think we can't keep talking about it. Go do something. And I felt that just meeting with the, the students in this, and just, just do something. You're going to, remember, like you said, you know, we're saying, why these students are not leaving here? Is it the weather? It's not the weather. We have jobs here, but other regions do a significant better job to suck them out of here. So we're getting beat. You want to be competitive? You're getting beat. We're losing very good people to other places. And don't, it's not because of the weather. It's, there's other parts of the world that have terrible weather, and they're working there. So it's not that. We're just getting outbeaten. And I, want, I hope it, I want, really want to hurt. I want it to feel that it hurts right here when I say we're getting beaten. That way you're going to go, well, nobody wants to lose because we're losing that battle. There's other parts of this country or other parts of the world that are, know how to do a better job attracting kids that go to Clarkson. Isn't that horrible? <laughs> we can't figure that out. They're beating us, and I think we blame everything else. It's the weather. It's the politics. No, we are getting beaten, period, end of story. Five... Five opportunities. Think about that. I saw, okay, in the back. Uh, Jeff Franco, you got a real question this time? All right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Five years. Uh, three. Try three. Three years. I think the, the, uh, the vision of success in, in, at TransFinder specifically is to keep innovate. And, uh, you know, I have a really big theory about how we innovate software. It's the, we listen to our clients, we're trying to get a lot of our clients feedback and they give us, you know, great feedbacks. Our service team tells us, if you do this, if we fix this bottle, it won't leak and we won't get as many calls. All right, good idea. 
Salespeople, man, if you just put this feature, like put a nice label, I'll sell you so many more of these things. <laughs> and so, right, salespeople give you awesome feedback because they want to sell. And then, of course, there's another one that no one asked about this bottle to have the ridges. That way it compresses. Nobody asked that. So, of course, we're going to do that. And, of course, you're going to get everyone mad. Salespeople are going to go, but you didn't put the label. And service are going to go, you didn't fix the leak. So I think you've got to do all three. Innovate some stuff. Definitely do some clients' needs and assessment. And, and listen to your sales folks. So continue that. And I think that is part of the success. I mean, that, that you should never change. You should never change that. You listen to your customers. Right? I mean, is that a... So one quick question I want to make sure that people realize. So Tony's not only the president and CEO of Transpire two blocks up the road, he is also the founder and president of the New York Biz Lab. That's right. So tell me, why did you, why did you start the Biz Lab? What's the purpose of the Biz Lab and why did you start it? That's great. Well, I think the whole idea is to, to teach people business, is to teach them that there's great opportunity and to show them, hey, there's help here. Don't leave. Don't leave. It's really about, I don't want to lose more people. So Having the Biz Lab here is to give some young companies opportunity to say, well, maybe we'll learn something from this guy. You know, maybe, maybe he's got, you know, this old guy now. <laughs> maybe he's got something to share. And I think, that, you know, and it made me realize that if we create an environment that we attract some young people, some, some no, new companies, some new ideas, you know, maybe, we, we, maybe that idea doesn't go too far, but we win the battle. They stay here and do something else. It's really what we got to do. So that was the whole idea of this lab. Can we just uh, keep some more people? Obviously, I want them to stay in Schenectady, but it's just keep them in this area. We win more than you can imagine. So I'm tired of hearing we don't, well, there's not enough people. Well, they're leaving every May. They leave. They get in their car, mom and dad, they get in the car, and they leave this area. Or they get in a plane, they leave every May. They, a new batch coming in here in the fall. They really do. So don't tell me that they're not here. There's a lot of people here. And colleges, he's already getting five offers. They're not going to say, hey, Tony, why don't you come get some of the kids? Because, you know, five offers not enough. Let's get ten offers. He doesn't have to anymore. So it's our job to do that. Very good. Thank you. Back here. I think we, we definitely do. We go through, and by the way, we go through a significant um, interview process. I've, I've heard some numbers, Rick, maybe you can help me, that the number of, of interviews ratios to what we actually hire is worse, if I can I say it, than on Harvard it's easier, to get a, it's easier to get into Harvard than it is to get into transfer. Yeah, we, I think last year. I don't know how year, I made it, but. I think last year <laughs> we could have had over. Your parents one, paid a lot of money. Right. <laughs> over a thousand. Maybe you got to pay a lot of money. Right. Over, over uh, a thousand uh, candidates, and I think we ended up hiring about 20 or 25 last year. So it's significant. But, yeah, we do. We try everything. Now we're doing a whole new video uh, interviewing that the first thing we you know, if you're a candidate you have these great questions that people at the company ask you questions about you know what do you do you know just uh, what's your program and skills or sales and so an employee actually asks you questions a video and then they have uh, three tries you know maybe fix your hair a little bit and it's a video you know those are things that you could do over and over again and uh, we're just trying things but yeah we want to get a smart person is always going to be someone we want Someone who's dedicated and wants to work hard will always take that person over. Someone that has tons of experience, but yeah, but I don't want to work a full week. It's like if you're a Sienna grad, you do have a slight edge. I think so. There is an edge. No. With Sienna. So uh, did I answer your question? Good. So Tony, um, you've given a lot back to the community, right? The Biz Lab is sort of a way of giving back. You do a lot of other really wonderful things. Uh, talk to us about how you think. Uh, that responsibility lies with businesses, right? At some point, as you were saying, we're losing these, we're losing these students. That's our fault. It is. Right? It's not the student's problem. Nope. That's our fault because we're, we're letting them go. We're not doing a good job. 
So how do you think about the responsibility of business and what can businesses do to sort of help move the ball down the field? Well, I think it's, it's simple. Call every college and university in this area and, and, and make sure that there's an opportunity. And I'm not going to the career center because the career centers, those are students are thinking, you know something, I want to get a job someplace in the capital region. So the career center is actually, I hope I'm not offending somebody, but the career center means I want, a, I want a job, I make a decision, go into the career center at the college and say, what kind of jobs are posting? And that means someone actually wants that. Majority of kids think, I'm not getting a job, I'm going to graduate, and then I'll worry about it. So we need to convince those kids that are not looking for jobs. The one looking for jobs, they're going to get a job immediately. How about those significant others that are thinking, I'm not staying in this area. I had, but first of all, I traveled to about 10, 15 colleges my mom and dad brought me, and we never said that, hey, pick your college, because wherever you pick, that's where you're going to spend five more years. Okay, I never, I, we went to 15 colleges, and... Um, we never discussed with my mom and dad about which one I'm going to actually stay after I graduate. We talked about the culture. Is this the right fit for me? I'm being a little bit sarcastic, right? Is it the right fit? Is all that? No one ever says, well, pick that place because you're going to probably get an awesome job there five years later, right? So I think this is where most kids are going to go, I'm going to be gone. That was part of the plan. I picked one out of 15 and I'm leaving. So we have to work very hard to convince them. And I think everybody could do it. And if you're a restaurant, you could do that too. Because restaurant, you will gain. If more people are in this area, you'll get more, more meals served. You name it. Every, every company will benefit. I'm serious. I saw a question in the back over here in the corner. Mark. Mark. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you have employees with shared knowledge. So the software engineers. And about, we have about... Uh, Probably about 35% of the company is software engineers. I'm curious because so much talk about the U.S. and China and the particular trade deals and business agreements and things like that. What have you learned about your business in China and what's ahead on that front? That's obviously going to be critical in some of those countries. It definitely makes me a little nervous for sure. And uh, clearly I don't have all my eggs in one basket, but that's where the talent is. And this is the kind of things that we, we're taking risk because what's the alternative, Mark? You know, our term, they're going to have a big, big riding. There's a for lease or for sale building on 440 State Street. And uh, that be, that's the alternative. And I'm not going to do that. So therefore, it is a huge risk. And obviously, I have to minimize my risk. But China, when I go there, as being American, th we're loved there. They know that we're part of their economy. I never felt uncomfortable. I felt so good. The people are there are extremely smart. And the technology is off the chart. Vending machines, there's no buttons, there's a huge flat screen. I'm using an app and I could just, and a thing comes right out. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that, and by the way, everyone has that. And it's, it's just the technology that I see is just off the chart. And we're so behind. And I'm trying to tell people that you have no idea how behind we are in technology. I could go to a regular uh, you know, corner store to buy things and they have a vending machine with a massive touch screen and I could just an app and say I want the Pepsi can. I put no cash and it just spits right out. And by the way, speaking of cash, when I go to China, I'm the only one who actually is bringing around cash. They look at me like, what's that? Well, it's your money. I got it at the airport. Nobody uses that over here. Tony, I thought before you we know? get ready. So I just want to tell you, I think, um, you know, it's the politics but the people love us. They think we're the, they all want to become American. They love our culture. Well, tell us about the, the name. That was an interesting story. Well, that's true. So to create a company there, it took about 12 months to create a company. And it's even down to what's the name of the company. I mean, today, so this is the thing that we, we have no idea how good we have it. You could go to, uh, uh, to uh, LegalZoom or all those products or any of these fine uh, uh, legal. Or Phillips Lytle. Right? right? Phillips Lytle. Phillips Lytle. And you go there. And maybe you could do it in 30 days, or, or a, but usually you get it done in, in a couple of days. You get yourself a company, right? Many companies here. And uh, it took a year to get a company established. A year. They came back with, what's the name for? What does it represent? Like, what do you care about the name? <laughs> no, it has to mean something. Even the name of the company at, uh, uh, that's in uh, Shanghai, 
we had to come up with different names. It had to mean something. So the government then just wants to create, you know, ABC company, and here you go, slap it together with a pen. No, it has to be. It's that pride. You have so to really. Is, so what's know, our name there, and what's it mean? Uh, which it's uh, the meaning over there is actually it's the virtue of. Um, it's almost like a virtue. We had to come up with something that has to go with education. It's the virtue of a, of the of the education passed from a from a teacher to the student. I mean, right? We had to actually come up with this different ways. And, and it kind of sounds like trans. It does. So it really does. <laughs> so it's kind of no. Catchy. It really actually does. And but those are things that I personally I love the food. I love the food. I love the people. But you know, and I felt it's the competitiveness. These are just we. I. I'm, again, I was not born here, but if I was here 50 years ago, I bet you we're the same way, our being competitive. And that's what we need to be. Mark. All right, Tony, I thought before we ended, because we always promise to get you out at 1 o'clock sharp. That's one of our promises. You can always stay as long There's as you want. some more food, too. And there is the food that arrived. Yes. But please let the people that eat first go. Because you can hear their, stumble, their stomach right. grumbling, so you'll know they're the ones. Um, I want you to end on a, a uh, proverb from Papa. So is there something you want to share, that good one here, that we can go out on? And then I want some closing remarks. Well, I think there's, uh, based on what I'm talking, talking about, there actually is one. And, I, and it's going to be about the rooster. Because I think this is something, it is about roosters. And by the way, before I tell you the proverb, I have to just, just in case you, you got don't live one in, minute. you don't live on a farm, you have to know what it means, a rooster. So there's roosters, right? They're, they crow. They crow in the morning. You know, they really, they do crow. But once the, the dominant uh, rooster crows, then all the rest, the smaller ones, actually follow. Okay, so I just want to make sure, just in case you don't live on a farm, that's how it works. So the proverb is really easy. So the proverb goes, when the little rooster, again, little rooster crows, the big one has already sung. That means when you hear someone say something, uh, someone else said that already. When you hear an employee make that statement, it means a manager said that, someone in your leadership, someone else said that. If they're a little rooster, well, figure out who that big rooster is. Really, that's who made that happen. But in, in, in this conversation, I feel like I'm the big rooster. And a lot of you should be big roosters if you're not, because we do set the tone. And a big rooster set the tones and all the little roosters at that point. So I hope that that's awesome. in a real fast way. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. Give it up for Tony Sipatella. Bela, that was great, as you promised me. Where to start? I learned a lot from Tony. What did you think were the most interesting points? So I think there was a couple that really stood out at me. Uh, one was, here again, there's this great story about the value of internships. He started at TransFinder as an intern while he was still a student. And here it is, uh, 15 years later or so, and he's now CEO. So, you know, you and I have talked about this in the past, Many of our other guests have talked about the importance and value of internships that they've taken. And boy, this one really just jumped out at me. I think it's the only one where I've ever heard someone go from an intern to the CEO. Yeah, this is amazing. So agreed. The, get out there yeah. and, and try. It's Some people are nervous about trying to get an internship. Some people get frustrated. Just keep hacking away at it and use your network because these are critical pieces of life. And even if you hate your internship, we've said this before, it's okay. You can cross one thing off your list that you don't want to do. And that's oftentimes more important uh, as you figure out the journey in your life, the things that you don't want to do. And I've also given this advice to mid-career people who are wondering whether they should take a job in a different field or not. I'm like, look at it as an internship, right? Do it for a year, six months or a year. And if you don't like it, you can always go back to your old field, right? But- It'd be cool if we let people who'd been in their jobs 10, 15 years do an internship, take a leave of absence, right? Go try something different. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that really jumped out at me, Mike, was uh, his saying of go figure it out, which I actually think he got from his father. Uh, but, you know, there's many things in life that do not have a script. There's lots of things we all do at work uh, and in other parts of our life uh, where there is no script and you have to go figure it out. And I think that was good advice and, and helping you build that confidence uh, that you can figure it out. And that's the one thing that you ho we hope, at least I hope, and I'm, I know you're the same way, that we instill in the students that we teach in our education system is that we give them the skills and the confidence 
so they can go figure things out. We don't give them the script or the answer, but we give them the tools and the confidence. I think the fancy word for this is unstructured problem solving. And it is the ability of having students. And I've literally, I've had students in my office today that I've talked to them about. I don't know how to go do this for you, right? I don't know the answer. Go talk to people, ask questions, do some research and GFIO, right? Go figure it out. But it's this unstructured problem solving. You don't have four steps. You don't have a formula, right? You've got to go put together the pieces in a way that gets you the result that you're looking for. It's awesome. And I thought the other part uh, that sort of stood out at me was uh, Tony clearly takes the notion of understanding that the buck stops with him. In other words, he is the ultimate decision maker. And it's it's a responsibility for him to make those decisions. And, you know, I, I really think it jumped out to me when he told his story about uh, in any company or any organization it's important to have an odd number of people when you're sitting down to make a decision. Why? It's a tiebreaker. And then he says, it's really important to have an odd number and three is too many. Uh, And, you know, that brought a a nice chuckle and laugh, but it also sort of talks about the seriousness of how he views his responsibilities as being the key leader and the key individual in sort of making these decisions to help guide the company Uh, as it goes along its journey. The flip side of this, Bela, is the role of the leader as change manager. And he talked about how the employees get mad at him because he makes these decisions, right, and changes things too fast for some employees' likings. Because people, we know this, the way the brain works cognitively, most people don't like change. They like routines, and they like doing the same things over and over again. And Tony's made a really good point. And, you know, I've been in this situation, I know you have too, in our entrepreneurial days of staying up nights worrying if you're going to make payroll. And you have to change so you don't die, right? It's, it's the, he used the term dinosaur. And I think that's great. So to me, that was my question I was going to pose to you, Bela, is how did you balance this need to change and need to grow um, with maybe some of your employees' interests in kind of keeping things this the same for a while. So they had some time to learn and adjust. Well, you know, I think <clears throat> that's a great question, Mike. And, and, you know, I struggle with that and have struggled with it uh, many times in the past. The, the challenge here is in any organization, there's, there's actually parts that shouldn't change. So for example, I helped start and run a medical device company. So there were certain elements in our manufacturing processes and in our FDA certification, where you had to follow the rules, like, you know, to the to the T. And if you didn't, you could actually get the whole company shut down. So there you want people who really like and groove on that stuff. And, and those rules don't change. Those rules have been the same for a long time. So in that, in certain parts of the organization, it's very important not to have change. Then on the flip side, there's other parts where you're thinking about strategy, you're thinking about new products, you're thinking about innovative ways of making products, innovative ways of engaging with your customer. You have to constantly change. And that's where, you know, I think about uh, the Darwinian cycle, uh, where, you know, you talk about generations it takes to evolve and change. And I think the Darwinian cycle in business keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, in today's modern world, think about any business, any successful business that's still around today <clears throat> and reflect back on what it was doing 10 years ago. And I bet you it's totally, totally different. There may be some common elements, but I bet you their products are different, their services are different. And if you look around, there's very, very few companies that have been able to bridge that transition for 50, 60, 75, or 100 years. Um, you know, even even look at a company like General Motors that makes cars, and they've been making cars for a long time, but boy, the way they design cars, the way they manufacture cars, the way they deliver cars is totally different these days than it was even a short 20 years ago. So I think in order to survive, you have to change. And there are, again, certain individuals and certain types of personalities that really enjoy that. So I think as a leader, part of your responsibility is hiring the right people, figuring out where their strengths are, where their comfort zones are, and which ones you can push outside of their comfort zones, and which ones, if you push them outside of your comfort zone, are either going to shut down or they're going to leave. So to me, those are the challenges. 
Yeah, it makes sense. Disrupt or be disrupted. And you need to find a team of people and motivate them properly so that they can help you disrupt. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, that's, that's what business is about these days. Whether we like it or not, yeah. that's, what, that's what's going yeah. on. Well, that leads to the last point that we were going to talk about, I think, Bela, which is human capital and the challenges that Tony faced in literally in an economically challenged area, right, where there's people who need jobs, right, of finding the right mix of talent who are willing to work for a good salary, right? What's your take on that? Well, you know, this, this is always a challenge. Uh, and I think if you talk to people who are running growing companies, we see this in our VC business. You can be in New York City. There's a talent sh shortage in New York City. You can be in San Francisco. There's a talent shortage there. You can be in upstate New York, Schenectady, New York. Pretty economically, let me just say, not a vibrant economic uh, part, of the, uh, part of the country. And there's still certain uh, labor shortages or talent shortages, I should say. And so I think that's the real challenge as people think about careers, they think about sort of what they're going to do in life. Um, how do I take my interest, combine it with an education, and then, then also figure out how to marry that into something that is in demand and something that uh, I can differentiate myself in the marketplace and, and make a contribution to a business or an organization? And, you know, so that's a, that's a real challenge. And I think companies struggle with that. I hear about it all the time, whether it be from our venture investments or whether it be from, you know, uh, networking events I go to, that CEOs are always struggling with finding talent. And uh, so there's lots of jobs out there. There's lots of opportunity. Um, but there needs to be a good match between what you bring to the table and what those organizations are looking for. But Bela, contrast this with if you open any business magazine or, or jump on the web and look at any site and everybody's screaming that the robots are taking our jobs and AI is going to drive people into unemployment and things like that. And I just think there's an element of that that's true. I get it, right? But there's an element of, of that that's not true, that there's always going to be a need for people, but people have to have the insight to match the skills and knowledge up to the jobs that are there in the, in the short and medium run. Um, and yeah, I think exactly what you said is true. I'm all for a liberal arts education. I'm all for having philosophy majors and history majors. But I think if that's what you want to study, you got to pair that up with a skill set that's in demand. If you want to do philosophy, there's all kinds of things to do with ethics and privacy and social media, right? And I think those companies are hungry for people with those thinking skills. But you have to pair it with an understanding of how social media works and coding and software and things like that. So to me, there's this just figuring out the balance of how do you double major or major in a minor or do a thesis or a project or an internship, right, to blend these skills. So it matters maybe less what your degree says, but more the knowledge and skills that you have underneath it. And how do you figure that out, whether you're a 50-year-old looking to make a career change or a 17-year-old figuring out where to go to, to, to college or if you should go to college, right? These are the things you should be talking about with people, that you should be reading about, you should be asking questions, doing your homework, right? Figure it out yourself, right? Going back to this thing is, hey, where can I match up my interests with my with the job market? And how can I get the knowledge and skills to, to fill that gap? I think there's plenty of jobs for people who have the right skills. It's training people to figure out what those skills and knowledge are to fill those gaps. There's the, If you can do that, you'll be set for the rest of your life, right? A absolutely, Mike. And I, you know, I don't worry about the AI and robots uh, taking away all the jobs. Uh, I'm old enough that I was around for sort of the first uh, robot and AI, quote unquote, revolution in the early or late 70s when I was working at GE Research and IBM Research. And I remember those days when robots were sort of first entering uh, manufacturing jobs. And, uh, you know, let's take cars, for example. Car bodies used to be welded together by people. They were hot, awful jobs. And in the 70s, robots basically took over that job. Robots weld car bodies these days, and they have been for a long, long and time. Painting and painting. Too. That's right. That was another it was one. welding yep. and painting. Weld, welding were the and painting. two big first initial applications they, of that. Because yep. those jobs killed people. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I mean, they're, health-wise, they're awful. 
and uh, mm-hmm. however, that created a whole bunch of other jobs. So this sort of change uh, in in sort of the world, whether it be uh, how you drive or how you fly an airplane or or the skills that you need, if 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 technology, AI, robotics comes in and it will displace people. Clearly it will, but it will then create other opportunities in different areas. And I think that's the challenge for our higher education system is to help people sort through that and to make sure we educate people so that they're they're willing to make that transition. And here goes back to how we started this conversation, which is about change. The one thing you can be sure of is that these things are going to change and continue to change and I think change at an increasingly rapid rate. Love it. That's a great place to wrap it up, Bela, I think. Excellent points. Um, listeners, we're happy that you joined us again in our podcasting adventure for this week. Uh, we hope you found the last hour interesting and thought-provoking like we did. Um, as always, we have a couple of small requests. One is if you have questions about what we discussed, topics, potential guests you'd like to see, hey, by all means, reach out and get in touch with us. Our email is bela.an.com mike at gmail.com and two if you like what we're doing hit subscribe on your podcast app or like if you haven't done that already or even uh, take a few minutes and uh, consider writing a quick review Um, alternatively if you know other people that might find us interesting please share us with them that's it for this week from here in schenectady new york thanks for spending time with us we look forward to having you join us for our next episode see you next week mike hey thanks bela it's been great i'll talk with you next week and to all of you listeners Have a great week and auf Wiedersehen from Münster, Germany. This podcast is produced for Mike and I by our friends at Busy Media of Schenectady, New York. They can be found at busymedia.co.